for the masses, a political pipe dream of the booming 80s, a risky gamble that could lose me my shirt, or a real and worthwhile aim for a democratic society and a highly enjoyable activity for the individual. This program will demonstrate that deeper share ownership is desirable, that it's achievable, and that it can be both profitable and great fun for everyone. Of course, many of us own shares already. If you've got a pension plan or an endowment on the mortgage, or perhaps you've bought some unit trusts, you're already an indirect share owner. And millions more of us became direct share owners as a result of those privatizations during the 1980s. Remember all those excited queues? More than 9 million people now own shares, the majority of them as a result of offers like these. People who were attracted to the idea of share ownership through the government's privatisation programme almost invariably made very shrewd investments. Most privatisation shares continue to perform exceptionally well. This is true of the more recent issues as well as the earlier privatisations. But few of these people have become regular investors on the stock market. For many, the image persists of there being something special or difficult about buying shares. What did go on in the stock exchange in the old days? What was the Big Bang? And don't you need expensive computer equipment to buy and sell? Or could it be that this mystique is just a smokescreen put up by professionals who want to deter individuals from taking their shares into their own hands? There's no real mystery about the stock market. It's a market like any other, supermarket, flea market, or a market like this. In order to have a market, you need three things. Buyers, sellers, and a commodity to sell. In this street market, the storeholder has fruit and vegetables that you and I want to buy. There are hundreds of different things on offer. Apples, avocados, beans, broccoli, carrots, courgettes, and cauliflower. Some of them are more sought after by larger numbers than others. Some are more exotic and appeal to fewer customers. The trader buys this stock, sets a price, and if you want the produce, you pay him. If the price isn't right, you don't buy. And if the price isn't fair, nobody will buy. The stock market is very similar, except that instead of buying a pound of apples, you buy a stake in one of the many companies whose shares are on offer. So what kind of companies trade their shares on the stock market and why? Britain has two and a half million of small businesses which are owner-operator, private limited companies. Sainsbury's was once like that, a small dairy shop that was very successful and got bigger and bigger until, like many other companies, Sainsbury's reached the point where the very success meant that it could no longer pursue its expansion plans without outside investment. One way of gaining that investment is to go public, to offer shares in the company for sale to the public for an agreed price. To do this, they sell shares to the public and the investing institutions and have them traded on the stock market. Companies obtain the money they need to expand and grow, and in return for your investment, they pay you, the investor, a share of their profits. In the same way that we saw lots of different products on sale in the street market, and on the shelves here. So the stock market offers shares in many different companies. Many have been established for years, but equally each year there are also many new companies offering their shares for the first time. The stock market divides the companies into sectors of operation, shops and stores, industrial, utilities, building for example. Apart from their first appearance on the stock market, companies may issue additional shares to fund expansion to build new shops or factories, to research and develop new products, or to buy other companies. Being in business has its risks. It's not every company that has a sure-fire guaranteed recipe for success, as I know very well from my time as troubleshooter. 
It follows, therefore, that buying and selling shares has its own risk too. We've all heard the government health warning that share prices can fall as well as rise. Well, it's true. You rarely obtain substantial reward in any enterprise without taking some risks. Investing in shares carries a risk. You should be able to ride the downs as well as the ups. You should never invest money in the stock market, which you cannot afford to lose if everything does go wrong. Thank you very much indeed. But if you do have some spare cash, there's no better place to invest it than in shares, as this program will demonstrate. Companies benefit from wider share ownership. It's an essential feature of true industrial democracies. Individuals benefit too. It's an interesting and absorbing activity, an opportunity to put your knowledge and skill to work, to make your money grow in a way few, if any other investment opportunities you face can offer. Thank you a lot. It is important to heed Sir John's warnings about the risks involved in buying and selling shares. It's not a surefire route to quick returns and nothing can be guaranteed. We've all heard about the Wall Street crash, Black Monday, other financial disasters. So now let's look at some of the issues surrounding the stock market and some of the facts of stock market investment. In the last 10 years, a thousand pounds invested in a carefully selected portfolio of shares would now be worth 4,910 pounds. The same amount invested at the highest rate in a building society will be worth just £2,088, and each £1,000 of property value only £2,080. The same pattern is true over a longer period too. So, if you can spare an amount of cash for some time, shares may represent one of the best ways to make it grow. But people invest for different purposes. Some shares are selected because they're good at providing a regular income and just as important, income that can continue to grow unlike the interest from a building society deposit. Share income is derived from dividends, the name given to the way companies share their profits with shareholders. Other people choose shares because their price is likely to go up and therefore when they sell them provide substantial growth of capital over a period of time. And of course many shares pay good dividends and regularly increase in price so you can get the best of both worlds. It's for you to choose whether you want your shares primarily for dividend income or share price growth. Or you could create a portfolio which over time could give you both. And of course you can change your portfolio at any time to suit your changing circumstances. Choosing to invest in shares is deciding to opt for long-term savings. Carefully selected shares are an ideal means of planning for longer-term financial commitments, such as helping to provide for school and college fees. A portfolio of investments made at the time your children are born could greatly ease the burden 10 or 15 years later of providing the level of education you want for them, which you may find difficult to support out of income or from other savings. You can sell your shares to help pay the bills or rely on regular income from dividends to help out. Many people dream of owning a second home for weekends or for regular holidays. A timely investment in shares now may provide the capital growth to help fund such a purchase in later life. Share ownership can also form an important part of planning for financial security in retirement, a period of life which we're told will be longer and richer in opportunity for the great majority of people in the future. Shares can fund your ambitions and provide a fascinating way of spending time. Well, of the 10 million or so people who own or have owned shares at some time, very few of them actively trade. In fact, among the majority of people, there persists the image that share trading is the preserve of the rich and very sophisticated. Without all the popular advertising campaigns which accompanied the privatisation issues, people can still find share trading a daunting prospect. Most are content to be marginally involved in share ownership through unit trusts, pensions or employee share schemes. This is a great pity because the direct private investor in shares can get a much better deal. The organisations that offer managed funds generally have very large overheads to support. They spend a lot of your money on management. Look at what happens. 
Of each £1,000 invested, anything up to 10% can be taken by management, research and marketing costs, leaving your actual investment nearer £900. In fact, few small investors realise that when they make this sort of investment, they're really much smaller investors than they think. That's to say, a smaller amount of money is working for them than they expect. And the situation with pensions and endowments is far worse. Many people have found to their cost that if they try to cash in an endowment policy in the early years, they get nothing back at all. All. The commercial managers for unit trusts, insurance and pension funds are dealing with huge volumes of shares for very large institutions. Despite this, many consistently underperform in comparison with the direct investor. The average of unit trusts falls far short of the average stock market performance. And as for the worst, you're also kept a very long way away from your money. As a unit trust investor or endowment holder, you have no control over your money. You can't move it quickly if you spot a good investment opportunity or need it for other purposes. It no longer seems like your own money that's invested as you are a lone individual among many thousands of others. When you invest directly yourself, you are in control. And of course, you really care what happens to your investment. But you may say these are the experts. They know what makes share prices move. They have access to highly sophisticated research to help them identify investment opportunities. They understand economics. They understand international currency markets. They understand the wider picture. So how can I, as a private investor, hope to compete with this? Well, the answer is very easily. Let's have a look at some of the factors that actually influence share price movements. about the government's ability to bring its expenditure down or in line with its income and thereby cut government borrowing. The, government the economy is hot news. Our screens, airwaves and the press are filled with reports of the latest figures. Treasury forecasts, business confidence, manufacturing output are all reported at length. ...to deal with exceptional circumstances. Mark Webster, News at One in the city. The FTSE, that's the popular acronym for the Financial Times Stock Exchange 100 Share Index, is watched assiduously. So, how can the individual investor keep abreast of developments, interpret them accurately and make the appropriate investment decisions? What effect do these international economic factors have on the performance of individual shares and your portfolio? The fact is that the long-term performance of shares has been remarkably little affected by the major economic shocks of the last century. They do have a short-term effect and some people have lost out by panic selling at the bottom of the market. Fund managers may respond to major economic indicators by moving their holdings to safer market sectors. But while it's good to keep abreast of world economic affairs so as to be well informed, it is not the only significant factor in selecting shares or in setting share prices. The message from history has to be, don't panic. In the street market earlier, we saw similar products at different prices. The same factors influence share prices as prices on the stalls, supply, demand and performance. When bad weather reduces supply of fruit, prices rise. When there's a glut, they fall. People want oranges for eating more than they want Seville oranges to make marmalade. So Seville oranges are cheaper as they're less in demand. And the stallholder who always supplies you with good quality produce, no rotten apples, limp lettuce or stringy beans, can charge more than his competitors offering lower quality produce. On the stock market, it is the company's past performance and confidence in future company or market performance that are the most significant factors in affecting individual share prices. Companies which use funds well to make profits which are shared out through dividends are more attractive than those that make losses and declare no dividends. So people clamour to buy their shares and the price goes higher. When general confidence is high, this is described as a bull market when companies aren't performing well and investors lose confidence and start to sell their shares, there are lots available and the price falls. This is a bear market. 
Let's take a look at the share prices of two companies over the last five years and see what were the major factors that influenced changes in the share price. From 1988 to 1990, Air Tours traded at a very similar price and was exactly in line with the average performance of the hotels and leisure sector of the stock exchange. In 1991, Air Tours exploited a gap in the market left by the collapse of the international leisure group and significantly increased their own market share. Profits improved, leading to great interest in the stock market for Air Tours shares. The price doubled in a couple of months and continued an upward trend throughout 1991. Further acquisition of travel agency Pickford's and a bid for Owners Abroad Group have kept the market active, with Air Tours significantly outperforming the sector. This performance has been achieved in a period when the Gulf War and recession have both had an adverse effect on tourism and leisure in general. It was the company's ability to spot opportunities and manage its affairs, especially in difficult times, that paid off. In something of a contrast to the Air Tours price graph, Sainsbury's shows the pattern of minor ups and downs associated with the retail sector. But in the period 1989 to 1992, Sainsbury's share price continued to make overall progress. The retail sector is affected from time to time by threats of price wars and market saturation, which lead to short-term share price falls. Sainsbury's outstripped its rivals during 1990, a good year for retailers, and showed great resilience in the downturn in 1991 and led the recovery through 1992. Sainsbury's performance demonstrates the wisdom of remaining loyal to a company, the management of which has proven its skill in weathering retailing and stock market fluctuations to provide shareholders with good dividend income and substantial capital growth. When you have a personal shareholding in a company, it gives you a real interest in news, current affairs and analysis. In fact, whole sections of the newspaper you used to throw away become essential reading. Trying to anticipate macroeconomic and individual company trends really is exciting. In fact, share ownership can be fun. So how do you go about buying some shares for yourself? You can buy shares through your bank and some building society branches will carry out transactions. You can select a traditional stockbroker who's willing to handle relatively small transactions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I help you? Well, um, my uncle died recently and he left me a small legacy. It was £20,000 in fact. He had some shares in the TSB himself, and I was considering purchasing further TSB shares. Do you think that's a wise investment? Right, with that sort of sum, I'd really recommend uh, possibly spreading, spreading the portfolio around a little bit. You can buy shares directly in a share shop. Good morning, Mr Oliver. How can I help? Good morning, Loxley. Uh, I've been looking at uh, United Biscuits, and I think I'd like to buy £500 worth. Or you can deal from the comfort and convenience of your own home through a telephone share dealing service. Good evening, this is Mr Gibson. Can you tell me the price of Rolls Royce at the moment, please? Yes, certainly, Mr Gibson. Rolls Royce shares closed today, selling at 124 and buying at 127. I see. Um, I'd like to buy 5,000. Could I take your client reference number, please, Mr. Gibson? Yes, it's 127465. Would you like there to be a best or limit order, sir? Yes, buy the best, please. May I just confirm your order? You'd like to buy 5,000 Rolls Royce at the best price achievable. Buying and selling shares need not be a hassle. With direct contact by telephone, you can carry out the transactions you want at a time that suits you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Bye. And share transactions are often no more difficult than many other important purchases we make. 
Remember, however, it's important firstly to consider your own personal circumstances, to plan carefully, and to do your own research. With shares, there are a number of sources of background information that it's sensible to consult before deciding on your own investment portfolio. We've already seen that the news media devotes substantial coverage to economics, city, and company items. Many newspapers and magazines have advice columns specifically aimed at the small investor. And there is one publication aimed entirely at the needs of the private investor. Launched early in 1993, ShareFinder has quickly established a reputation as an important source of information for the direct equity investor. It combines research and analysis from many sources, all presented in ways which beginners can clearly understand. ShareFinder is produced by ShareLink, whose knowledge of the special needs of the private investor is based on trading over a million shares a day for people like you. Incidentally, however you decide you're going to purchase your shares, you may want to consider buying them in the framework of a personal equity plan, a PEP, in order to maximise your tax benefits. And don't forget that with many companies being household names, your own personal observations can be very important indeed. How's your local Safeways doing, for example, compared with your local Asda, Tesco's or Sainsbury's? In fact, one leading fund manager in the United States did most of his research at his local supermarket where he could see what people were actually buying. So, whatever share dealing routes you take, you manage your own investment portfolio, you take your own investment decisions, and you keep an eye on the performance of your own shares. It really is very easy, as we found out when we went to visit some private investors. Well, like many other people, I suppose I had a tip from a friend. He suggested that I invested in some boot shares when I was a teacher in Cardiff. And the shares did very well, and that made me interested. And I, as a consequence, started investing in other shares as well. Although, as a professional, uh, during my work in life, I didn't have sufficient time to look at stocks and shares and the like, but invested... Um, I, I kept an active investment, but, but I'm more active now. I have more time since I've retired. I used to look for capital growth when I was, when I was a working man. Uh, but now I've retired, I'm now concentrating upon income shares and looking particularly at income shares in PEPs to get better value. There's a stockbroking firm here in Manchester that, I, that I've used uh, for some time. But more recently, I find I can do a better deal by dealing through ShareLink the Birmingham-based company, and they at the present hold my PEP shares as well. Um, I, I do some traded options, and I do that through my Manchester broker. I invest in equities, and I found that a better use of my money, which is uh, parked somewhere else, than leaving it in a building society. I found equity investment um, has helped me with foreign holidays and things, but it hasn't been at the specific uh, objective when I've started investment. I've wanted my cash to work hard. It, it's become a, a considerable interest of mine now, and I, and I enjoy it. Uh, my wife complains sometimes that I read too much of this pink paper that comes drops through the letterbox every day. But uh, it, it's, it's become an interest now, and of course a profitable interest as well. well. I wasn't qualified to do any job, so I thought I have to find something. I decided it was much more comfortable also sitting at home on my bed and put, picking up the telephone and buying, you know. So first I read all the newspapers and all the city pages and then just picked you know, a few shares and they did well, so that encouraged me. And then I went on doing it. Then I put some money away and then spent the other half, you know. Because the money I was investing was not for the housekeeping or anything. That was my husband was managing all that. But the extras for the school fees and for the children, because we had five children, all one year difference, you know. So we had to do something, you know. I mean, I would go to Sainsbury and I think they are doing very well, you know. I'm sure they'll be all right. And things, sometimes I'd gamble and it often came off.
I was just lucky. I enjoy it. I find it very exciting. I'm waiting. I listen to all the financial news at quarter to 10 at night. My husband used to get four newspapers. I remember Times and um, three other papers. And we also got one was Sun. We only got the Sun for the racing tips. <laughs> But, but I would read four of them, you know, just the city page, and then make up my mind. You know, new issues come, they tell you, and if I think they are all right, I would buy. And then I, for my, 20, my daughter's 21st birthday, I bought her a new car, because my shares had done very well at that time. Well, originally, um, our first sort of dip in the water was with um, a company who my wife was working for at the time. It was, in, in fact, when it first went onto the market and the shares absolutely shot up. It was a company called Blue Arrow, <laughs> Unfortunately, um, one or two things happened and they came tumbling down. But, uh, yeah, we didn't... I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't mega amounts of money invested and it was just, well, you know, take it on the chin, really. So, there we are. And then um, we bought some BT. We bought the second issue of BT. Um, which did really well. Um, I think we ended up with about a four. I, I cashed them in after about a. I think we made about forty percent um, in the space of about eighteen months, including dividends. So that was quite good. You know, if, if we can achieve, you know, with a mixture of dividend and you know selling out at the right sort of time, say a fifteen percent, twenty percent, you know, if you're lucky or whatever, that's great. Um, what we've done now is we've we actually buy them. Um, through one of the major sort of share dealing companies, um, and and just do it over the telephone. So it's, you can sell it at the you know optimum price. I'm a physiotherapist by profession, and uh, it's rather a long way from money. But uh, as I say, I came into this really when I inherited some shares, and it never occurred to me to sell them. I thought, this is exciting, I'm going to enjoy this. And I think investing should be exciting um, as an interest, which gives you pleasure. I'm not the sort of person who takes risks. Um, I find it very difficult to risk a lot of money in the fact that you might lose it. I look for the um, big industrial blue chip type groups, and I was fortunate in acquiring some of those. I think the utilities are terribly important, water and gas and electricity, because None of us can live without those. Um, I sometimes use a broker and sometimes use a bank. It's quite convenient these days, you know, the high street banks will do it for you. It was just after the BT privatization by the government, right? And uh, quite a few people bought them, like, but uh, unfortunately I missed out on them, right? Then after that, you know, because a lot of people made uh, quite a bit of money out of them, so I just got interested uh, from there on, like, and so the next privatization they made. I bought some shares like and uh, with that I made a bit of money like there's no way I would have made that money if I had the uh, my money in the building inside you at a bank so it just started from there I mean some people they look at a newspaper like I mean some people look at the sports some people look at page three I mean I used to look at the shares you know so it just exciting really you know what I mean well, what I did was, first of all, right, you know, when I invested my money in shares, right, uh, I invested in quite a number of shares, right. So what I did was, uh, after I made a profit, right, so the profit I made, right, so that was the money I was buying shares with. So really, you know, it's just money I made from shares, which I reinvested into shares. So, I mean, that's just extra money, really, you know, to me. So, I mean, it's, it's not money I've worked for, like, it's just money I put in shares. I mean, I've had my ups and downs as well, like, you know, I mean, like the Black Monday, I mean, the war in the Gulf, like, you know. But, like, it's, uh, you make money in some shares, you lose in some shares, so what it is, right? I mean, the money you make in one share, right? So it's a balance, it balances it, it out, like, you know, I mean, you can make it in one, lose it in the other. So that's why it's best to have a... Rather than one share, like best to spread them out, like so. I mean, recently I had one uh, Eurotunnel share, right? Uh, I mean, it was stuck out there for a long time, and then I thought, I just, one day I just thought, well, you know, because I look at the papers every day, I look at the uh, teletext and so on, right? I thought, well, I'm going to go for that, right? And uh, within a couple of months, like it, I'm 
made about a, you know about 1500 pounds within a couple of months like and there's no way i would have made that much in a building society you know so i was very pleased with that i mean the money i made from there right i've booked a holiday so i'm treat the family for a holiday really <laughs> I, I, my first job was with the Economist newspaper, and um, there was this um, uh, department uh, that um, did the company reports, which was next door to mine. And uh, the chap there said, "Oh, that's a good idea. You know, um, want to get into these um, steel companies that are being denationalised. They were later nationalised, became British Steel, but uh, that was in the 50s. Um, they um, they denationalised them, and I found that they. I bought the shares, put about 50 pounds in them." And I found I'd got £100 in about a month or two. And then I reinvested in the next one that came up. I think they were called Colvilles, and I can't remember the names of them all now. It's a portion of my capital that um, I allot for shares, and um, I sell a share and reinvest in another one. I did that today in, um, in a firm, and I sold out of one and then bought into another. And I'm sort of building up, hopefully you know, sort of nest egg that way. The thing to do would be to take um, shares in a company that you're interested in for um, any particular reason and then um, um, follow it a bit before and um, decide then. I start very small and then um, by just taking my time and get um, advice from books and watching the market and listen, especially to the government, a lot, a lot of this stuff market hinge and what the government do, how firm the government is. Sometimes I can spend three, four, five hours just going through the television, you know, with the teletext and a, a notebook, write down, take note of what's down, what is up, why they're down, why they're up. My biggest favourites are banks, you know. Lloyds, Bartleys, Natwes, Standard Charter, sometimes the Irish banks, Scottish banks. But then utility shares are very good, very good. And for long-term investment, then you can also look to industries, firms, especially small firms with big a um, lot of growth and big potentials, but those are long-term investment. They also pay very, very good dividends. Well, I've just bought a new car, and um, I am away in three weeks to the West Indies, Jamaica. I'm about to look for a holiday home. Um. In 1955, um, I joined ICI, um, and as you probably know, it was a share um, operating scheme, share bonus. Um, and of course, one had to get interested, um, because it was part of one's salary. With a young family, um, I had very little spare money, as you can well imagine. So really, it was um, making you know, a few pounds off the ICI shares and um, then developing from there into um, other shares as they came along. Um, it's in a fairly small way, but uh, if one can, uh, you know, make 30 or 40 percent um, capital growth over a relatively short period of time, perhaps a year or 18 months, um, it allows us to have our overseas holiday, etc. So what exactly is it that investors buy and sell? Well, as Sir John told us earlier in the programme, you're buying a share in a company, a stake in how well it performs. And you'll receive a share certificate like this as proof of ownership. Of course, those of you who have already bought shares or got them free through the Abbey National will already know what one of these looks like. The certificate records the company, the date and the number of shares you own. When you sell them, you receive a contract note confirming the price at which you sold, the commission charged by the broker and the date when you will receive your money. You will also need to sign a transfer form in which you confirm the change of ownership. It's the same as sending your car registration document to the DVLC to report a change of ownership when you sell it. Buying shares is even simpler. You decide which company's shares you want to buy and how much you want to spend. Your broker will advise you of the current price and how many shares you will acquire. The broker will issue a contract note with the details of the transaction. 
At the end of the next stock exchange accounting period, these are generally every two weeks, you'll be sent a statement of all the transactions carried out on your behalf and the balance due. The share certificate will be sent to you within a few weeks of the transaction. This comes from the company's own registrars, not from your stockbroker. In addition to the value attached to your shares, many companies offer special perks to shareholders, discount travel or special offers on the company's products or services. Every shareholder is also entitled to attend the company's annual general meeting, which can be fun. But don't ever let perks be a reason for buying shares, simply an added bonus. Keeping an eye on your investment couldn't be easier. Prices are listed every day in your newspaper and on CFAX or Teletext on your television. The whole process is very straightforward and it's carefully regulated by the stock exchange. And then there's ProShare, an independent, non-profit making organisation set up by the government, the London Stock Exchange and industry. It's ProShare's aim to make sure that investors have everything they need to invest with confidence. So there's plenty of support on hand. When you decide to invest, it's important to remember some basic practical advice. Consider first your own current and future personal circumstances and your risk profile. Certain shares are more risky than others and you should only trade in shares where you are sure you can meet all your investment and personal commitments, irrespective of what happens to their value. Set a limit to the amount you can really afford to invest. Never spend the housekeeping. Decide whether you want capital growth, income or both and over what period. Do plenty of background research from the newspapers, share finder and your own experience. Select the companies that will form your portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Be sure to diversify with a good range of companies. Decide on the way you are going to trade through your bank branch, through a traditional stockbroker or by directly managing your affairs yourself through a telephone share dealing service. Buy some shares and enjoy the excitement and potential for profit of equity investment. Keep your investments under regular review. But do remember the government wealth warning. Share prices can fall as well as rise. If you keep these simple rules in mind, you should enjoy a long and successful time as a private investor. You will soon come to realise that shares are for you. At the end of the video, you'll find a contact number for ProShare who can provide further help and advice to would-be investors. I am a firm believer in deeper share ownership. It's why I'm the president of ProShare, which is dedicated to broadening the share ownership base of this country. We keep an eye on the requirements of the small investor, making sure that your needs are properly catered for, that your investment is handled correctly, and that you're treated with respect as befits your involvement in supporting British business through investment. I must say again that while investing in shares can be profitable, share prices do fall as well as rise, and you should not use money in the stock market that is essential to maintain you and your family's way of life. But with some cash to spare, there is no better place to invest than in shares. You will have a personal stake in a number of companies. Whole areas of radio, television and the press will start to interest you in a way they never did before. Share dealing is endlessly fascinating. If you decide that equity investment is right for you, I hope you'll have as much fun through your involvement in the markets as I have through mine. But let's not forget that people ultimately invest in stocks and shares for one compelling reason, for profit.